narrow plain of Marathon in eastern Greece, a battle rages that will alter the course of Western civilization. On one side, the army of the Persian Empire, the most powerful fighting force in the world. On the other side, the army of Athens, half its size, led by the famed Greek general Miltiades. This is a battle of military brilliance in the face of overwhelming odds. A battle for the future of Greece and for the supremacy of the ancient world. Two civilizations are about to collide. East meets West on the plains of Marathon. Death comes swiftly. For six days, a brutal attack by a faceless invader stains the soil red. Those not butchered are enslaved. The aggressors are the heavy infantry of the mighty Persian Empire. They are called Immortals. The victims are residents of the island of Euboea in the Greek city of Eritrea. 600 Persian warships had set sail on the Aegean Sea and swallowed every Greek island in their path. But Euboea is not their final destination. They're heading to Athens. Five-year-old commander, Alexander the Great. It's his time now. Alexander has this kind of larger-than-life aura about him. He's handsome with a muscular build, and he's extremely charismatic. His troops pretty much worship him. In less than five years, uh, he had managed to carry out a major strategic plan to, from Greece to invade Persia and destroy the Persian Empire. In five years, he managed to suppress his own domestic opposition and then finally was able to, to force a cataclysmic battle uh, in modern-day Iraq on the plains of Arbella, where he destroyed the last remaining Persian army and then by right of conquest became emperor of all of uh, Persia. Some say Alexander's pedigree destined him for greatness. They believed he's a descendant of Hercules on his father's side and Achilles on his mother's. Alexander's empire now stretches from Greece to Egypt to modern-day Afghanistan, one of the largest in the history of the world. But Alexander's appetite for power and glory is insatiable. Five years after he defeats the Persians, Alexander is ready to take on a new opponent. He stands with his 32,000 battle-tested soldiers along the banks of the Ionia, down to Athens, Corinth, Sparta, all those states that, whose names pop up in history. Each city-state was a self-contained society, uh, had its own lands, its own army. But aboard his warship, the Persian commander Datis cares about only one of these city-states, Athens. He's so confident he'll be able to destroy this historic city, the only question in his mind is exactly how he'll destroy it. He can either attack Athens directly from the sea, uh, is one possibility. This is a bit difficult. Athens is walled, uh, and an amphibious assault from the sea against opposition is pretty iffy business. So he decides not to attack Athens head on, rather to pick a spot about 25 miles uh, away from the city along his line of route uh, and to land there and figure one of two things would happen. Either the Greek army responds and comes out to meet them, or he would land, assemble his army, and simply march on to Athens from the ground. So given the choice between the land campaign or an amphibious landing of Athens itself, he chooses the land campaign. 
Datus directs his fleet of 600 ships about 26 miles away from Athens, at Marathon. He moors his ships in Marathon Bay and disembarks on the skinniest beach. The Persians then make camp on the northeast side of the plain, next to the Great Marsh. The Persian army is about to slam into Athens like a Category 5 hurricane. The Athenians know surrender isn't an option, but they're divided on how to prepare. Should they hunker down behind the city walls or march out to meet the Persians in battle? Some in Athens believe that an open field battle against the Persians is suicide. But one Athenian disagrees. His name is Miltiades. And he has a personal history with the Persians. Miltiades is a very interesting character. Uh, he comes from a prominent family in Athens. And when he's about 35, he takes over a Greek colony in Ionia, on the edge of the Persian Empire. He rules there as a tyrant. This makes him uh, very unpopular in Athens. In the late 6th century BC, Miltiades' home on the Hellespont Peninsula is engulfed by the expanding Persian Empire. He's forced into military service. Now wielding a Persian sword, he must fight along his conquerors. The Persians soon spread north, cross the Danube River, and invade Scythia, modern-day Eastern Europe and Asia. Miltiades was in charge of guarding the bridges across the Danube over which the Persian army had come in order to uh, go into Scythia and prosecute the campaign. Finally, after three long years in Scythia, Miltiades decided he'd had enough. Miltiades had never been a big fan of the, of the Persians, and he tried to get other Greek generals to agree that what we ought to do is burn the bridges behind Darius and his army and let them die of starvation or be killed by the Scythians. Uh, other Greeks would not go along with it, but it was Miltiades' idea, and it was picked up by Persian intelligence. So Persian intelligence were not very happy with Miltiades, as you might expect. Miltiades flees to Athens, but he's not welcome there either. The people of Athens still remember Miltiades as a tyrant and lock him up the first chance they get. Three years after his arrival in Athens, Miltiades faces the death sentence for tyranny. But he's got an ace in the hole. He knows the Persian game. And the Persians are on their way looking to destroy Athens. The Athenians not only spare Miltiades' life, they make him a general. But Miltiades has to wonder which fate is worse, execution or being hacked to little bitty bits by the Persian warriors. Miltiades chooses to face the Persian blade. And rather than hide behind the walls of Athens, he wants to meet the Persians on the battlefield. But the final decision on whether to fight is not his to make. Athenian democracy extends to the army, too. So when an argument erupts over what to do at Marathon, the council of ten generals must decide what to do. Attack now, or retreat and try to get help from other Greek city-states. The vote is five to five. The tie-breaking vote falls to a man named Callimachus. He is the polemarch. Uh, it's a ceremonial position in the Athenian army. Miltiades uh, makes an impassioned case to Callimachus, saying, it's up to you whether Athens is reduced to slavery or rises to become the greatest of all the Greek city-states. He explains that failure to fight now will shatter the democracy along factual lines and make them easy prey for the Persians. Callimachus is convinced, and he votes to attack. Miltiades gets his war. He leads the entire Athenian army, roughly 10,000 strong, 26 miles east to the plains of Marathon. The odds are overwhelmingly against Miltiades. The Persian force is colossal. More than twice the Athenian size. 20,000 infantry, 
3,000 archers, 2,000 cavalry. Miltiades takes a look at the situation and realizes immediately he's severely outnumbered. He's not only outnumbered, he's outgunned in the sense that there are fairly substantial archer and, and uh, cavalry contingents. Even if the Athenians can hold back the Persian infantry, they have no way to counter the Persian war horses. It's a massive mismatch. Cavalry is one of the keys to Persian military success. They were one of the first armies to fully integrate horses and heavy infantry for a devastating one-two punch. And funnel their enemies into the chomping jaws of their main infantry lines. Miltiades is outnumbered and outgunned. The Athenians have never faced a force like this before. But they have cut their teeth on some of the greatest warriors of the ancient world. For centuries, these two Greek city-states shed each other's blood. But 50 years before Miltiades faces the Persians, a conflict erupts between the Greek neighbors that will ultimately lead to the Battle of Marathon. It's 540 BC, 50 years before the Battle of Marathon. Two Greek city-states, Athens and Sparta, attack each other on the open battlefield. The rivalry between Athens and Sparta is uh, kind of like Michigan versus Ohio State, except with spears. Uh, they constantly seek any advantage they can over one another. Uh, while most of their battles are, you know, provincial squabbles, uh, one of them gets the Persians involved and eventually leads to the Battle of Marathon. Athens is known as the birthplace of democracy. Sparta, their neighbor to the west, couldn't be more different. Imagine that the U.S. Marines had their own country. That's Sparta. They train constantly, weapons, tactics, armor. It's pretty much all they do. Now, the Athenian-Spartan relationship is very bipolar. Sometimes they help each other, and sometimes they fight. At the time, Athens is ruled by a man named Hippias. He is, however, wildly unpopular with the Athenian aristocrats. So they plot a coup and overthrow Hippias with the help of some unlikely allies, the Spartans. Now, the problem with the Spartans helping you is that they wouldn't go home. And that was the problem that the Athenians had, was how to get rid of the Spartans. Well, they rose in revolt and drove the Spartans out of Athens. Uh, and this it was that period about 400, uh, 540 BC, which was the beginning of Athenian democracy at about this time. The problem was this. Inevitably, one would expect the, the Spartans to counterattack. Athens believes they need an ally to defend themselves against Sparta. They turn to the Persian Empire. So that's one of the first examples in Greek history of a smaller state trying to ally itself with a larger state, in this case the Persian Empire, in order to protect itself from aggression of another state, in this case Sparta. Athens sends an envoy to the Persian province of Ionia, now modern-day Turkey. At the court of the Persian governor, the envoy asks for Persia's help against Sparta. The Persian governor agrees, but on one condition. The Athenians must make a sacred offer of earth and water. The trouble is, the Athenians don't really understand what the offer of earth and water means. They think they're signing a treaty, just like the treaties they've made in the past with other Greek city-states. But to the Persians, accepting earth and water means they own Athens. It has become their colony. Without understanding what they're really doing, the envoys submit to Persian rule. All of Athens will pay dearly for this mistake. It made no sense to the rational Greeks. I mean, these are the people who invented logic, mathematics, and philosophy. For them, it was just a silly little ritual that really meant nothing. Now, the problem then is the same problem now. When you have two cultures reaching an agreement, Sometimes that agreement means different things to each party because the cultural context in which it occurs is different. Athens secures the promise of Persian protection, but Sparta attacks so quickly 
Athens has no time to call on her new ally. Determined to keep their new democracy, Athenians fight more ferociously than ever. They defeat the Spartan invasion on their own. Now this is important because Athens had asked the Persians for help, but they don't need it. They defeated Sparta all by themselves. The Athenians now felt that the agreement they had made with the, Spartan, uh, with the Persians was null and void and made the terrible mistake of telling the Persians that. This infuriates the Persian emperor, Darius I. It amounted, from, in the Persian view, to little more than an open revolt, and Darius uh, resolved that he was going to bring Athens to heel. The Persians send heralds to Athens and demand payment of customary taxes. The Athenians throw them into a pit to die. Athens has spit in the face of the world's most powerful empire. Throughout history, alliances often come with unintended consequences, but few have the magnitude of the one of the treaty between Athens and Persia. If the Athenians never asked for Persian help against the Spartans, the world might be a completely different place today. It sets off centuries of conflict between the East and the West. And the first major battle is Marathon, where more than 20,000 Persian infantry, cavalry, and archers are preparing to burn Athens to the ground. The Athenian general Matiades and 10,000 Greek infantrymen are colossally overmatched. But Matiades does have one advantage. How does he offset the uh, inferiorities that he suffers relative to the Persian forces? And the answer, as almost always in antiquity, is the same. Terrain, terrain, terrain. Location, location, location. Historians debate the exact route the Persians would have taken to get from Marathon to Athens. Some believe they would have taken the coastal road, a route that passes through the Vrexiza swamp. But then you would have had to go through a swamp, which was doable. But then you would have been a problem where the Persian army would have been in column of march, trying to gain the road with the Athenian army on its flank. Always a bad idea. The only other way to Athens is through the mountains, beginning at the Vrana Valley. If the Persian army intends to invade Athens, it's got to go through the mouth of that valley. And it's not very wide. It's not very wide. So what Miltiades does, he decides to block the valley. And he deploys his troops in the mouth of the Vrana Valley in order to make it impossible for the Persians to advance further. Miltiades has positioned his infantry in the valley like a cork in a bottle. The Athenian phalanx is made up of lines of tightly organized interlocking warriors. They can move forward and back easily, but not side to side. The phalanx formation is incredibly effective at holding ground and moving forward. With rows of men packed tightly together, they use each other's overlapping shields to form an armored wall. Miltiades anchors his flanks on the rocky sides of the hill and then uh, goes about chopping down trees to put them on the flanks as well. Why does he do this? He's well aware of the fact that the weakness of the Greek phalanx is its flanks. Whenever it has died in battle, it has died because it has been taken in the flanks, either by another phalanx or mostly by cavalry. In the valley, the flanks of the phalanx are well protected. So you're not going to rely on the steepness in the rocks alone. You pile it with brush and trees and logs so that there can't be any cavalry attack. So in, just by positioning his troops where he has, he has essentially taken the cavalry out of the fight. Brilliant maneuver. The Persian commander Datus is not concerned and assembles his infantry. For three days, the Persians line up for battle. But the Greeks choose not to engage them and stay in their protective zone. It wins the day if there's no fight at all. Its job essentially is to protect Athens by blocking the road. 
So if you would like to stay here for several weeks, that was quite okay with Miltiades. It's not okay, of course, with the Persians. Finally, the frustrated Persians initiate an attack. The Athenians form up for battle. But the Persians do not immediately send in their infantry. They first launch a blistering barrage of arrow fire. Under a tidal wave of missiles, there is nowhere for the Athenians to hide. Four ninety BC. It's the Athenian Greeks versus the mighty Persians on the plains of Marathon. The Persians draw first with a devastating arrow attack. You can imagine this wall of mist literally blocking out the sun, raining down on the Athenians. But the Athenians brush the arrow fire away like annoying gnats. Thousands of Persian arrows, very few Athenian casualties. And despite being outnumbered two to one, the Athenians, led by General Matiades, taunt the Persians. The Persians are on a mission. Break through the wall of Greek soldiers, march to Athens, and burn the city to the ground. Exactly what happens next is up for debate. Every historian has his theory of what went down at Marathon and why. And that's because we only have one real source, the Greek historian Herodotus. The problem is that Herodotus is more like the world's first blogger than an objective historian. He blends events, myths, anecdotes, hearsay into this great story, but nobody in their right mind believes it's all true. So who attacked who first at Marathon and why? Well, from the Athenian position, there's no need to attack anyone. But Datis, the Persian commander, is itching for a fight. After the failed missile attack, there's only one thing for him to do. All that's left is a frontal assault. Now you're going to have to mix it up head-on, one-on-one. 10,000 Persian light infantrymen charge across the Marathon Plain. Waiting for them is the Athenian phalanx, a bronze wall of spears and shields. More than a million pounds of flesh and bone collide. Helping the Athenians create this wall is the hoplon shield. The Greek shield, known as the hoplon, uh, is more than just a glorified garbage can lid. It's a revolutionary innovation in warfare. The hoplon is a large, circular, bowl-shaped shield made of wood and faced with bronze. It can withstand arrows and punishing sword blows without splintering. But what makes it truly remarkable is what's called an argive grip. The soldier passes his arm through a leather loop in the middle of the shield and holds onto a handle near the rim. And why this is important is, is it gives you very good control and uh, much more force with the shield, whereas the old tether grip in the center uh, wouldn't allow you to, to produce a lot of force with it. The Athenians stop the crushing charge. Now they go on the offensive. The Athenians' primary weapon is the heavy ashwood spear called the dory. Seven feet long, tipped with sharpened iron, the dory can smash through shields and armor. This spear is not thrown. It's used to stab the enemy with a gruesome thrust. In the 6th century BC, most Athenian warriors wear lightweight lamellar armor made of bonded strips of linen and leather. 
Some, however, wear heavy, rigid cuirasses, bronze plates sculpted to look like a muscular torso. Bronze helmets with distinctive horsehair plumes protect their heads, while greaves protect their lower legs. In full battle gear, the hoplites are armored head to toe. The problem for the Persians at Marathon is they're up against a determined Athenian phalanx that doesn't scatter during the arrow barrage. The Persian light infantry also doesn't have their usual cavalry support. So it's just sickle swords and wicker shields against a bronze wall of Athenians. The Persian commander Datis sends in wave after wave of light infantry assaults. Each time, however, they impale themselves on the solid Athenian wall of spears. The Persians are unrelenting. Defeat is not an option. The issue of imperial prestige is at stake. I mean, what in all hell's name could possibly have motivated this pipsqueak of a nation, this backwater, to insult the largest empire on earth? For the Persians, Marathon is about more than just a broken treaty. It's also punishment for Athens' support of a revolution against Persia ten years earlier in nearby Ionia. Once an Athenian Greek colony, Ionia was absorbed as a province by the Persian Empire in 540 BC. But 40 years later, in 500 BC, a local tyrant incited a revolution. The people of Ionia then asked Athens for help. Athens was seen by her colonies as the kind of the mother country. And my guess, Athens considered herself the mother country. And so when her colonies asked for help, she sent troops. It was a mistake of the first order, to be sure, uh, but that's probably what motivated. Certainly it could not possibly be uh, uh, justified on the grounds of rational self-interest. The Athenians were joined by a force from Eritrea in nearby Euboea. They sailed across the Aegean to Ionia and stormed the capital of Sardis. It is another Athenian slap in the face the Persians will never forget. In 500 BC, ten years before the Battle of Marathon, the Ionian Revolt has begun. Several Greek contingents, including Athenians, attack Persian-controlled Sardis, the Ionian capital, and burn the city to the ground. To make matters worse for Persia, at the same time they are fighting wars in India, Egypt, and Scythia. The Ionian rebels score a major blow, but the victory is short-lived. The Persians increase their force levels and begin to suppress the Ionian revolt. The Athenians, knowing that discussion was the better part of valor, went home, as did the Eboians. And uh, the Re Ionian revolt simmered on and off for the next five years until it finally uh, simmered out and, and flared out and Persia re recaptured the Ionian coast. But the Persian king Darius is furious. He vows vengeance. Darius calls upon his god to grant him vengeance against the Athenians. He even makes a servant come up to him three times every night during dinner and whisper in his ear, Sire, remember the Athenians. So even while he's dealing with Egypt and wars in India and Scythia, Athenian payback is always on his mind. King Darius attempts to exact revenge on the Athenians in 490 BC at Marathon. But so far, the Athenians have survived a massive Persian missile attack. And now they are holding fast against the Persian light infantry. Matiades has brilliantly positioned his defensive force. The Greek heavy infantry phalanxes are jammed in a narrow opening between the mountains, blocking the path to Athens. The Persians had chosen the battlefield, okay, by landing at Marathon, but the, the Athenians had chosen the terrain by using it to maximum advantage. And it's an old trick. But an effective one, as the Persian light infantry doesn't even dent the Athenian wall. The 
Persian light infantry retreats, but now Miltiades must face the elite force of the Persian army, the heavy infantry, the immortals. The legendary immortals are the stormtroopers of the Persian Empire. Faceless, they march into battle in complete silence. They are the Athenians' worst nightmare. In addition to their brutal killing ability, the presence of the immortals forces Miltiades to change his tactics. Miltiades, although he has prepared the battlefield expertly and to give him every advantage, still suffers from a great disadvantage. And that is the area in which he occupies, although it's relatively narrow, okay, is still wider than he has sufficient troops to cover. What he does is he weakens his center and moves the additional troops out. So that when you look at the deployment of the Athenian force, you're looking at a force that is relatively thin in the center, but has heavy phalanxes on either side. Weakening the center of his phalanx is a huge gamble. But then Miltiades rolls the dice again. He advances his line out of the protective valley. If he stays where he is, he knows that when the center gets hit, it's going to flex in. The problem when it flexes in, if he stays where he is, is there's not enough room for his heavy phalanxes on the end to maneuver inward. There's not enough room. They're jammed up against the terrain. So he has a very, very delicate tactical problem, and it's this. Miltiades must move his troops far enough to be able to extend his line so the phalanxes can maneuver. The trick is, how far can Miltiades move out from the valley? If he doesn't come out far enough, his flanks can't maneuver. If he comes out too far, the Persians can get around his flanks and surround him. And remember, all this is happening on the fly. Miltiades won't know how far is too far until it happens. The immortals close in. Miltiades needs to make his move. He orders his troops to redeploy. Herodotus tells us that Marathon is the first time the Greek hoplites ever ran into battle. And the reason they'd never done it before is that it's exhausting. The Greeks wear all this heavy armor and carry long spears. So running just wastes a lot of energy. The other problem with running is the tight phalanx formation itself. Their strength lies in their unit cohesion. If that breaks apart as they advance, they're immediately vulnerable. My guess is that Herodotus is describing a redeployment at the run, not a movement to contact at the run. At a given signal, everybody moved in as close to format as they could, moved out to 200 yards, stopped, and then reformed very quickly. So that by the time actual contact occurred with the Persians, okay, the units were once more disciplined, ranks were dressed, ready to receive the charge. While historians debate many aspects of the Battle of Marathon, most agree about what happens next, an apocalypse of violence. The armies collide in a horrifying maelstrom of bronze and blood. The battle is so intense that some Greeks report crazed visions of ghost warriors who crash through the lines and cut down men at random. But the reality is just as terrifying. The Persians surge forward and the Athenians are beaten back. The weak center can't withstand the Persian attack. It's about to break. It's getting pushed back, 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 towards the valley. The hoplite dam is about to burst, and it looks like Athens is doomed. Miltiades' center is on the brink of collapse, but at the flanks, it's a different story. The normal tactics for the Persian infantry would have been to put the strongest units in the middle 
and the weaker units on the wings. This is because the wings are usually supported by cavalry. Now Miltiades would know this, and it may be why he bolsters his own forces on the flanks. With the Persian cavalry rendered ineffective by the terrain, the Athenians are able to chop down the weakened Persian flanks. The center of the Athenian line continues to be pushed back, while the flanks hold strong. Herodotus tells us that just before the center broke, they were rallied by their officers to find new courage and actually counterattacked. They counterattacked enough to stop the forward movement in the center. And at that point, the heavy phalanxes on the wings, bang, closed in on the side took them in the flanks, literally had them in the V, and literally slaughtered them. In a daring stroke of military brilliance, Miltiades has completely turned the tables on the Persians. The Battle of Marathon has become a Persian bloodbath. While keeping his flanks anchored, the Athenian general Miltiades has pulled the center of his line back, drawing the Persian infantry into a death trap. Hemmed in on three sides, the Persians can't maneuver. They panic. One of the reasons for their panic probably was something caused by the fog of war and by something that happens to men in battle no matter how well they are trained or how well you are disciplined. Every now and again, the disease of fear gets into your soul. And when that happens and panic gets into your ranks, it's done. You can't stop it, no matter how disciplined you are, how controlled you are. More than 6,000 Persians perish, while the Athenians lose fewer than 200. Among the Athenian dead, however, is Callimachus, whose tie-breaking vote pushed the Athenians into battle. Some cite Marathon as the first known example of the pincer maneuver, or what's called a double envelopment. But this isn't truly the case because Miltiades only uses one force, so he does not completely envelop the enemy. The Persians still have an avenue of retreat. And they use it. The Persians race back toward the beach. Some say the Athenians immediately chased the Persians back to their ships, uh, but this is pretty unlikely since the Athenians would be completely exhausted at this point. What likely happened is Miltiades and his men rested until they were able to go back on the offensive. It took a considerable time for the, Gre for, for the Persians to try to grab what's left, their wounded, their horses, and put them on, 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 try to get them on the boat. Uh, it might have taken, you know, several hours, eight, ten hours. At some point, the Greeks were rested, and at some point, they reformed, and now they began, pursuit is too strong a word, they began literally marching towards the beach uh, in order to encourage, let us say, the, the Persians to leave. Fighting breaks out again as the Persian rear guard tries to protect the retreat. Athenians butcher them and capture seven of the fleeting boats. Herodotus recounts a story where a Greek soldier grabs a boat with his left hand and has it chopped off by the fleeing Persians. Undaunted, he grabs the boat with his right hand. It also gets chopped off. So the Greek soldier bites the boat and tries to hold it on the beach with his teeth. This is the kind of hyperbole that Herodotus is known for. The Athenians rout the Persian infantry, 
but the danger isn't over yet. The Persians aren't sailing back to Asia. They're heading straight for Athens. Miltiades sends a Greek messenger from Marathon to Athens with news of the victory. The Athenian runs the 26 miles from Marathon to Athens, runs into the town square, yells up his hands, Nike, which means victory, and drops dead, probably of a heart attack or a stroke. And this is where we get the phrase to run a marathon, 26 miles, the distance from Marathon to Athens. But at the same time that this inaugural race is being run, Miltiades realizes that the fight is not yet over. Once Miltiades realizes what the Persians are doing, he sends another runner back to Athens to alert them. Then he assembles his troops for a forced night march back to the city. It's hard to imagine how tired these infantry guys are at this point, but if they hope to save Athens, they have to keep going. The Athenians march all night long. It's difficult to know how long it would take the Persian ships to sail to Athens from Marathon, a distance of about 62 miles by sea. While a ship of that day could make the trip in about 10 hours, a lot would depend on the currents, weather condition, weight that the ship was carrying. Also, it's possible that some of the ships with the cavalry might have already sailed for Athens a day or so before. So Miltiades can't be sure if he had won the battle and lost the war. Early the next morning, the Persian commander Datis enters the Athenian harbor with his 600 ships. On the walls of the city, he sees Miltiades and the entire Athenian army. Datis takes one look at this, understands the difficulties involved of carrying out an opposed amphibious landing, decides better of it, turns to the coxman, turn the boat around. The fleet turns around and sails back to Persia. And Athens remains free. As the Persians sail away, the Athenian infantry can finally celebrate their amazing victory at Marathon. To commemorate the victory, the Athenians build one of the most iconic buildings in human history, the Parthenon, a massive temple to the goddess Athena. Carved into the wall of the Parthenon are 192 figures, one for each of the Athenian slain at Marathon. After the defeat at Marathon, Datis returns to the court of King Darius. Some suggest he's executed for his failure. And while there's no evidence for this, history never hears from Datis again. But what we do know is that Darius was furious. Furious because this pygmy little barbaric state has insulted the great empire of Persia yet again and got away with it. Darius swears in his mind that if he lives long enough, he will have his revenge on the Athenians. As it turns out, of course, he doesn't live long enough. Persian revenge for Marathon falls to Darius' son, Xerxes, who 40 years after Marathon personally travels to Greece to fulfill his father's wishes. This transmission of the desire for revenge against Athens sets up 40 years later one of the signature battles of Western military history, the last stand of the 300 at the pass of Thermopylae. At Thermopylae, the great Spartan commander Leonidas uses the same tactics against the Persians that Miltiades did nearly half a century earlier at Marathon. Marathon itself is one of those moments that is defining in Western history. In fact, it defines what it is to be Western and Greek over against Persian and Eastern. It's not the end of the story. In fact, it's just the beginning of the story. The Battle of Marathon tells the ancient world that Persia isn't invincible. It serves as a battle cry for future rebellions throughout the empire. Greece and Persia will continue to clash on and off for the next hundred years. The struggle catapults Greece from obscurity into the center stage of the ancient world.
It all begins on the blood-soaked plain of Marathon. He is a revered prophet, a freer of slaves, a hero of the Bible. He is the father of the Israelites, Moses. Moses' destiny lead his people to the promised land of Canaan by any means necessary. This is a new look at Moses and the Exodus story. He talks to God, but he's also a brilliant general. He doesn't just lead slaves. He commands an army of mercenary warriors. During the Israelites' 40-year march across the desert, Moses and his army fight battles of biblical proportions and defeat some of the deadliest armies of the ancient world. Moses is a master tactician. Moses is an unrelenting commander. Moses is on the war path to the promised land. The 14th century BC under a sweltering sun, Israelite slaves build Egypt, one brick at a time. If they fail, they suffer the consequences. But the Israelites are about to meet their savior. His name is Moses, and his story begins with murder. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. When Moses had grown up, he went out to his kinsfolk and witnessed their labors. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsmen. He turned this way and that, and seeing no one about, he struck down the Egyptian. Moses is, is significant, not only as a great political leader of the Israelites, but he really is the Israelites' first great general. A good reading of the Exodus book of the Bible reveals a first-rate military mind, a commander who knew how to organize troops, how to fight them uh, strategically and tactically, and a man who practiced deception in the military sense, almost as great as any other general in history. After Moses murders the Egyptian and buries him in the sand, he flees Egypt, escaping into the Sinai Desert. This is a great turning point in Moses' life, according to the Bible. He has sealed his fate in Egypt and is about to start on a path that will ultimately lead him to a great confrontation with Pharaoh, resulting in the exodus from Egypt. After living many years in the desert, God puts Moses on a path of bloodshed and brutality. God appears as a burning bush and commands Moses to return to Egypt and free the tens of thousands of Israelites from bondage. And he does exactly that. He goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. Then Moses unleashes the fury of God in 10 devastating plagues. Hail crashes from the sky. Water turns to blood, and the angel of death kills every firstborn Egyptian child. It's like uh, an apocalyptic car movie, and Moses, acting as God's mouthpiece, is running the show. Finally, Pharaoh admits that he's beaten, and he frees the Israelites. Now, you'd think that would be the end of the story, roll credits. But suddenly the pharaoh changes his mind and orders the army to hunt them down and stop them.
God, now in the form of a pillar of smoke and fire, miraculously leads Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt. Then comes one of the most famous miracles of the Bible, the parting of the Sea of Reeds. This is how the Bible explains the Israelites' escape from Egypt. They continue to Canaan, where they eventually claim the land as God-given. But this is just one version of the Exodus story. It's a great story, and it's the foundation upon which Judeo-Christianity is based. God leads the Israelites from bondage to a promised land. You get the whole Passover story and everything. Now, if we stop and retell this story from a military perspective, from a soldier's point of view, we get a very different, a very violent picture. The real question of trying to understand this uh, retelling of the Exodus is who are the Israelites? What are they doing in Egypt? And why doesn't Pharaoh want them to leave? According to the Bible, the Israelites originally migrated from the land of Canaan into Egypt some two centuries before Moses' time, around the 14th century BC. They settled in the land called Goshen, a fertile, prosperous area near the border. And the Bible tells us that they live here for 200 years peacefully coexisting with the Egyptians. But in fact, there are those who believe that the Israelites are more than just coexisting. There's a theory that the Israelites were actually major military players in the defense of Egypt. This theory comes from reading the Exodus story as a military campaign. Some believe the Israelites might be the same people as the Habaru, a group that includes merchants, construction workers, and farmers, as well as ferocious warriors. If true, the Israelites are likely in the land of Goshen for a very definite reason, to help defend the Egyptian border against attacks from the north. So the Habiru military mercenary arm can be put in Egyptian service as auxiliary troops settled across that key avenue of invasion to act as a tripwire and defensive troops in the event of an invasion from Canaan. The powerful Habaru mercenary army is about 1,000 strong. Soon, a new pharaoh rises to power and sees the fighting force as a threat. And he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them, so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. Pharaoh said he launched several wars to reassert Egyptian authority over Syria and Canaan. Now, when he looks at the route from Canaan to Egypt, what does he see? Israelite settlements. The Israelites have been living on the border for about 200 years, and said he knows they were originally immigrants from Canaan. As Egypt's military grip on the land of Canaan slips, Pharaoh Seti fears the Israelites in Goshen will join the Canaanite fight against Egypt. Now, he didn't expel them. Uh, what he did is he set them to labor. This is the part of the Exodus story when many believe the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. But that may be historically inaccurate. In the Christian translation of the Hebrew Bible, the text tells us that the Israelites were turned, set to slavery in the field, making bricks for Pharaoh's cities. But the Hebrew Bible doesn't say any such thing. What the Hebrew Bible doesn't mention the word slavery, it, it says instead that the Israelites were set to labor and uses the Hebrew term avadim. Avadim means workman or construction worker, or in a technical sense, what we call corvée laborers. Corvée laborers are recruited to build public works projects like city walls and fortifications. While they may have been forced to work, some believe they are not slaves. Now you can imagine that if the Israelites are held in fairly high regard as essentially the first line of Egyptian defense, and then suddenly are demoted to common workers, this might not go over too well. So after several years of this, the Israelites decide it's time to go. But when they leave, they may not be just a ragtag group of slaves. If the Habiru theory is correct, these are people who are skilled fighters, 
with the military capability of causing some pretty serious damage. Now, historians disagree, but likely the Pharaoh at the time when Moses comes and says, let my people go, is Ramses II. And after the plagues and all the drama, Ramses finally concedes to Moses. Then, 25,000 or so Israelites divided into their 12 tribes, the famous 12 tribes of Israel, flee Egypt. The great exodus out of Egypt begins. But soon, Pharaoh mysteriously changes his mind and launches his army in pursuit of the Israelites. The Bible provides a clue as to why he does this. The Israelites had done Moses' bidding and borrowed from the Egyptians objects of silver and gold and clothing. And the Lord had disposed the Egyptians favorably toward the people, and they let them have their request. Thus, they stripped the Egyptians. It says that the Israelites lacked provisions, and so they simply asked the uh, Egyptians for them, and the Egyptians gave them the provisions they wanted, including gold and silver. Well, this is a story that's really not believable, and if you read the Hebrew Bible, the phrase or the term that is used to describe what happened is nitzayel. Nitzayel means to strip or despoil. Whatever, whatever was being given was certainly being taken at the point of a sword. The first steps to the promised land are paved with blood. The great Israelite exodus out of Egypt has begun, and it's not a peaceful exit. Some believe that the Israelites sack an Egyptian city on their way out of the country. They're in a land which is surrounded by, or in, in, literally infested with, what we call store cities, small supply depots. It's also the place in Egypt of the giant cattle raising estates. So here are the provisions all around them. Okay, so what the smart thing might have been would have been to essentially sack one of the estates and provision themselves. The Bible says Moses leads the Israelite slaves out of Egypt. But some military historians believe he commands a mercenary group of skilled warriors. There are those who believe that the Israelites are this semi-nomadic group called Habiru. And one of the things Habiru are known for are their military skills. Pharaoh, who had let Moses and the Israelites leave Egypt, now orders his army to hunt them down and destroy them. The Bible says the Israelites leave Egypt boldly and defiantly. Well, certainly one way to show defiance is to take what you need on your way out. But even more evidence in the Bible points to a pretty tough Israelite group. It says they had weapons the children of Israel went up armed out of the land of Egypt. If you read the Hebrew text of the Bible, what it tells you is, in fact, that the Israelites were armed to the teeth. Their arsenal includes the short spear, about six feet in length. Its stabbing point is made of sharpened bronze. And the slashing bronze sickle sword, the most popular and deadly weapon of the day. After sacking the city, Moses leads the Israelites toward Canaan. But as he approaches an Egyptian outpost, Moses discovers that Egyptian chariots are in hot pursuit and closing fast. He's got an anvil to his front and a hammer closing on the back. Uh, he calls his commanders together and then gives an order that must have struck some as almost insane. He tells them to turn off the road and head into the southern desert. This appears to be suicidal. But Moses knows this desert. He spent most of his adult life here, and he's got a plan. If we look at Exodus as a battle, what we see is a level of military sophistication that's truly amazing. Moses takes his understanding of the desert terrain and uses it to go up against the most powerful army of the time, Egypt. Egypt in the 14th century BC is at the height of its power. It is a time known as the New Kingdom, and its power reaches north to Mesopotamia. 
But according to the Bible, Moses receives help against the mighty Egyptians. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel day and night. Behind this divine intervention may be inspired military strategy. Although the Bible portrays the pillar of smoke and fire as essentially a divine totem, perhaps even the Lord himself or the angel of the Lord, in point of fact, it's nothing more than a common command and control device used commonly by Egyptian armies of the day. Ancient Egyptian artifacts show how fire and smoke are used to lead and direct enormous armies spread out over great distances. At the head of the column, soldiers carry long poles with braziers or fire containers on top. In a world before night vision goggles, GPS, and radios, you need a way to keep your troops together in the dark. The Egyptians use fire. At night, the brazier is uncovered to serve as a beacon to follow. In the morning, the brazier is half covered to send out a smoke signal and tell the army it's time to move out. In fact, Alexander the Great, when he conquered Egypt years later, adopted this technique. Moses likely uses this Egyptian method of signaling to keep the Israelites on the move. That night, the pillar of smoke turns into the pillar of fire, signaling to the Israelites that it's time to make camp. The Egyptians see this, and it doesn't surprise them because they know what it means, time to make camp. They may camp themselves a couple hundred yards away because it's night and they didn't want to fight at night. But what does surprise the Egyptians is the placement of the fire. The Bible tells us Pharaoh is there. Not sure whether he would have been or not, but we'll follow the Bible on this. He sees this and probably doesn't think anything of it. Israelites are just making camp, except that the fire is closest to him relative to the entire Israelite camp. If the fire is at the head of the marching column, then the Israelites should be between Pharaoh and the fire. But it's not. It's closest to him. It appears that the Israelites are heading in the wrong direction, back to Egypt. Behind, the Sea of Reeds traps them. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are astray in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. Now, from the Egyptian perspective, the Israelites are lost. They're moving deeper into Egypt than, than they should be. They're not going to escape this way. What a bunch of stupid people, the Egyptians must have thought. Well, we didn't count on the brilliance of a first-rate tactical mind, and that is that Moses has set about deceiving them in any number of ways. Moses is about to perform a magic trick. He's going to make 25,000 Israelites disappear right before the Egyptians' eyes. The ruse begins with the placement of the pillar of fire. The Israelites aren't heading in the wrong direction. Moses has turned his people around so the fire is now at the rear of his column. The purpose is to both deceive and blind the Egyptians. Modern soldiers are taught what we call night discipline. When you're moving at night, the one thing you must do is avoid looking into a bright light because it has to do with the cones and rods of your eye, the way the eye functions. But if you look into a bright light at night, it can take 30 minutes up to an hour before you can see again, at least see clearly. So as long as that flame was burning in front of the Israelite camp, as best we know, it burned all night, the, the Egyptian soldiers from the camp several hundred yards away were functionally blind. They couldn't see beyond that light. Under this cover, the Israelites escape across the Sea of Reeds. Everyone immediately thinks of Charlton Heston in the film, Ten Commandments. He raises his arms, and the sea splits right down the middle. It's iconic, but it's also a fantasy. So what really happened? Well, remember Moses spent a lot of time out in this desert and knows the Reed Sea very well. He would probably be aware that a certain location at a specific time of day it can be crossed on foot. Moses' timing is perfect. They likely cross about 20 miles south of the Mediterranean, where the Sea of Reeds is a tidal swamp. As the Israelites approach, the tide rolls out. The Bible then states the wind begins to blow. Now, that wind is blowing from the southeast out of the deserts of the Sudan. It blows from the southeast at the same time as the tide goes out pulling it north. Within a small amount of time, that marshland of perhaps several hundred yards long suddenly is empty. 
of water, or at least the water is at such a low level that you could easily walk across it. Perhaps it's not a heavenly miracle, but it's still an amazing escape. To pull it off, Moses brings together his knowledge of the terrain, tides, wind conditions, and Egyptian tactics. And he has to keep 25,000 Israelites together who are not used to marching through the wilderness. If you've ever been hiking in a group, you know that's a miracle in itself. Daybreak. Pharaoh Ramses is in for a surprise. The Israelites have safely crossed the Sea of Reeds, and the water begins to flow back into the marsh. By the time the Egyptians get to the Reed Sea, the tide is rolling in. They can probably see the Israelites on the other side, so they chase after them. But chariots are too heavy for the soft, mucky swamp. They get stuck. Moses triumphs over the mighty Egyptians, succeeding with a brilliant military strategy and without raising a sword. He has avoided a superior force, deceived it into thinking he was going one way, gone the other way, and done it all because he had an intimate knowledge of the terrain upon which he had to operate. And he had that knowledge of the terrain because he spent 40 years wondering, if we can believe the Bible, attending flocks in that area. As was said of the Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo, he said, I've had this piece of land in my pocket for a long time. My guess is Moses had this piece of land in his pocket for a very long time as well. But the Exodus campaign has only just begun. Three months into the journey, a tribe of people called the Amalekites launch a surprise attack against Moses and the Israelites. The Amalekites are a hostile tribe that roams the Sinai Peninsula and southern Canaan. They fight on camelback, firing arrows at their enemies and cutting them down on the run. Moses has just outsmarted the Egyptians, but his challenges have only just begun. Next, he will lead the Israelites into a fight against a new and unexpected enemy. It's the great exodus out of Egypt, and the Israelites have just made a daring escape. But now, only three months after crossing the Sea of Reeds, Amalekite warriors ambush the Israelites from behind. Moses does something interesting. Instead of leading the Israelites himself, he watches the battle from the nearby hilltop. The Bible says that every time Moses raises his religious staff above his head, the Israelites win. But if he lowers the staff, they lose. Now, we don't know if this is some kind of signal or source of inspiration to his men, or perhaps a ruse to make the Amalekites think he has hidden forces behind the hill. But Moses definitely directs the battle in some way. With Moses on the hill, control of the army falls into the hands of another great Israelite hero of the Bible, Joshua. The Israelites fix their spear into the ground at a 45 degree angle to defend against the oncoming Amalekite camels. This stops the immediate onslaught and the fight descends into a hand-to-hand -hand splatter fest. The Amalekites launch a ferocious assault. From the hill, however, Moses inspires Joshua and the Israelites to battle the Amalekites. Despite being exhausted from the journey, the Israelite soldiers fight furiously and put down the Amalekite onslaught. It's a tremendous victory, but Moses knows there are much greater obstacles ahead. Moses is a realist. Sure, his guys just beat up on a raiding party of Amalekites. But if he tries to invade Canaan with a thousand men, he's going to have trouble. So, instead of heading towards the Promised Land, he leads his people south towards Mount Sinai. Moses understands he needs a larger, more sophisticated, and better trained army. But more soldiers means they'll need to manufacture more weapons. Why is Moses heading toward Mount Sinai? We really don't know the answer because the texts are silent. But what we do know is that a Canaanite group called the Kenites live there. And they're known to be metal workers, and the area around Mount Sinai is known to be a giant large mine for copper. 
copper, and tin make bronze, and that's what the weapons of the day are made of. When you smell bronze, at a certain point in the process, the copper emits a dazzling green flame. I could imagine the Israelites marching into this Tolkien-like Middle Earth type scene where these weird green flames were illuminating Mount Sinai. Many Israelites are angry about the detour. The Israelites complain bitterly about their conditions in the desert on the way to Mount Sinai. They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're exhausted. You've got to remember there are women and children here on this trek. How are they going to eat? What are they going to eat? To get them to leave Egypt, Moses promised the Israelites a land of milk and honey in Canaan. But what they get is sand, marsh water, attacks, and spooky mountains. The Israelites are on the brink of an open rebellion against Moses and his leadership. What happens in the Bible is whenever you have a revolt of the people and a punishment of the people, it's always cast in ritualistic terms that, uh, you know, they, they, they did something against God's will. But in, in, in point of fact, I mean, it, it, it more, far more likely is people are just angry horrified, uh, you know, uh, things aren't going well. Here we are in the desert. I mean, they, it says in the Bible, what are we doing following you, Moses? We should have gone back to Israel, uh, gone back to, to Egypt. There we had fish, we had melons, we had onions. What do we got here? Nothing, so to speak. Uh, so very human emotions of maintaining power. While the furious Israelites rage, the Bible says Moses climbs Mount Sinai. There, he receives 10 commandments from God. But he might also go up there to figure out what his next move is. Who can, how can he control his followers? Who can he trust? What will he need to invade Canaan? The Bible states that Moses remains on Mount Sinai for 40 days. When he finally comes down, he carries the stone tablets of God's law, the Ten Commandments. But when Moses reaches his people, he's stunned by what he sees. He finds that the people have created a terracotta or clay idol covered over with gold and they're worshiping the golden calf. He's furious. Enraged that his followers are worshiping idols, Moses destroys the commandment tablets. He then calls together the men of the Levite tribe. His orders teach the unfaithful a brutal lesson. He summons the Levites to him, it says. Every man put your sword on your thigh and go from tent to tent, killing even your relatives and brothers. And 3,500 died that day. Moses turns the Levites into a Praetorian guard, personal bodyguards beholden only to him. They do whatever he says, and oftentimes that means killing his own people to keep the rest in line. The Levites execute a terrible justice. We're not exactly sure why God or Moses chooses the Levites to do this business. There's nothing that's special about them except that they are the priests. It's likely that their religious conviction can never be swayed. This is the start of Moses as divine dictator. Up until now, the structure of the Israelite tribes has been very democratic. But now Moses has a direct line to God, and that's the end of all debate. Phase one of the Exodus campaign is complete, and Moses' tactical plan has been brilliant. Phase two, the conquering of the promised land of Canaan, will require a large-scale invasion. For that, he needs more than his 1,000 mercenary soldiers. What he does is he institutes, uh, essentially, a conscript draft from each tribe. And that's a great reform because it now means that Israel no longer has just a made-up army of mercenaries. Using population data, historians believe the conscription likely swells the army ranks from 1,000 to about 5,000 warriors. Forward reconnaissance teams scout the enemy. Heavy infantry form close battle lines in front. Light infantry are positioned in the middle to flank, defend, and move out in front for quick strikes with swords and shields. Slingers and archers are next in line to fire at the enemy from a protected position. And at the back of the column, Moses places another division of heavy infantry for defense. It takes two years for Moses to train and shape his 5,000 soldiers into a deadly fighting force. Except for chariots, which the Israelites don't have, Moses creates a mirror image of the Egyptian army. 
He knows how effective Egypt's coordinated attacks are and wants the same capabilities for his own army when he invades Canaan. His army is ready. His control is absolute. Moses is ready to conquer Canaan. The promised land of Canaan, rich and fertile, it has everything the Israelites want and need for their new homeland. Moses and the Israelites have been on the march toward Canaan for two years. But Canaan is a land already settled by powerful city-states with strong armies and fortified cities. It's not free for the taking. The Israelites have no intention of settling in Canaan as long as there are other people still in Canaan. They intend to attack cities and drive them out and to replace their populations with their old, this with their own population. This is a war of extermination. Moses leads his followers to a large oasis in the desert called Kadesh Barnea, about 12 miles from Canaan. Here, Israelite spies who have been scouting Canaan return with both good news and bad. They come back and uh, meet with Moses uh, at Kadesh Barnea, and they say, this is an impossible task. Uh, the cities are walled, the armies are powerful, they have chariots, they have, they have armor, weapons, uh, they have food. Uh, it, it would be impossible for our army to do this. Moses determines that even his 5,000-man army isn't big enough for the job. The invasion must wait. And so the Bible tells us they remained at Kadesh Barnea for two generations, which has been translated to mean 40 years. Uh, and in that time, of course, what would have happened is that the 25 a uh, thousand or so people of the Israelite nation uh, would have replenished themselves through uh, normal birth rates. Uh, so that uh, by the time uh, two generations had passed, you're probably looking at a community of about 35,000, which would now allow you, with a conscript base, uh, drawing on all adult males between the ages of, say, 20 and 35, to produce an army between eight and 9,000 men. The Bible states that finally, 40 years after the start of the Exodus campaign, Moses is ready to launch his attack against Canaan. He has trained his army well. They are a powerful fighting force. But Moses wants to fight on his terms, using tactics and strategies he first learned in Egypt and has been training with for more than 40 years. Walled Canaanite cities block the route north from Kadesh Barnea and a direct assault could destroy Moses' army before he ever gets to the Promised Land. So instead, he marches the Israelites east towards the Jordan River Valley. Moses knows that your strategy should dictate your tactics, not the other way around. His goal is to get to Canaan with the largest force possible, which means he should avoid fights along the way whenever possible. For Moses, the path of least resistance to Canaan is through the Jordan River Valley. But there's still one problem. A mighty tribe stands in the way of Moses and the Israelites, the Ammonites. There's no way around them. Moses has the Dead Sea on one side and a harsh desert on another. His only way to the Jordan Valley is through the Ammonites. They're a somewhat softer target than the Moabites or the Edomites. Moses isn't stupid. Diplomacy first. So he asks the Ammonite king's permission to pass through his country. The Ammonite king says, no way. Moses turns and calmly walks away. The battle is on. Moses again turns to Joshua to command the army on the battlefield. The Israelites line up opposite the Ammonites on the open plain. Moses watches as the two armies clash. Moses' army has been training for years. Today, they finally draw blood. The Israelites' heavy infantry smashes into the Ammonites' front lines. Bones are shattered. Limbs are hacked. The light infantry's bronze sickle swords slash mercilessly. The grass is soon slick with blood. The battle rages all day. But in the bloody end, Moses' well-trained army wins the battle. We think that both armies are about the same size. So, 
What accounts for the Israelites' overwhelming victory? It comes down to training and tactics. We know that the Israelite army is built upon an Egyptian model, divisions of varied forces that can fight as one. They are likely more mobile, more agile, and more disciplined than anything the Ammonites had ever seen. With the Ammonites destroyed, Israelites sweep through the Jordan Valley. They attack and ravage Canaan's neighbors in the lands of Edom, Moab, and Gilead. So the Lord our God also delivered into our power King Og of Bashan with all his men, and we dealt them such a blow that no survivor was left. One element of the Jordan Valley campaign that stands out is its brutality. Again, the Bible describes what happened when, when these fortified towns were taken. There's often great slaughter, burning, destroying of the towns and, and flocks and animals. And so you will ask yourself, why the need? Why the need for this kind of brutality? The Israelites don't want to live in the Jordan Valley. They're moving on to Canaan. So the worst thing they can do from their perspective is to leave a hostile force at their back as they push forward. The only way to make sure this doesn't happen is to wipe out the population. Ruthless, yes, also practical. Not just the men are slaughtered. Women and children are also killed. But before they march into Canaan, Moses will turn against a people who have been his allies for 40 years. Moses' army, some eight to 10,000 ruthless warriors, has cut a swath of destruction through the Jordan Valley. They now face the Midianites, a longtime Israelite ally. These are the people who took Moses in after he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. They are the people who Moses called family. His wife is a Midianite. Now, Moses gives a brutal order destroy them. A couple of Israelite men were sleeping with a couple of Midianite women. That by itself probably wasn't a problem from Yahweh's perspective, but they had now begun to worship Midianite gods, and they had turned their back on Yahweh. So Yahweh orders the children of Midian to be killed and puts Moses in charge of the operation. Every Israelite soldier, led by a commander named Phineas, marches to the Midian camp. They destroy everything. They butcher all the men, burn all the houses, loot anything of value. The only thing Phineas can't bring himself to do is kill the women and children. The Midianite camp is completely destroyed, but Phineas can't bring himself to follow Moses' orders to kill women and children, so he marches them back toward camp. Before the army even makes it back to camp, Moses rushes out in a fury and yells at Phineas, I told you to kill them all. He demands that every boy, every woman old enough to have slept with a man must die right then and there. They are all executed. This is all a prelude to the invasion of Canaan, and Canaan will be a tougher nut to crack than the tribal societies of the Jordanian Valley. Best now, best now to train the army for the horror it will face in the future. When the bloodletting ends, the ritual cleansing begins. The Bible states that any Israelite soldier who draws blood in battle must stay outside the camp for seven days. And this probably doesn't just mean physical cleansing. They might also use that time to cleanse their guilt. The horror of what they've done to other people would have left deep psychological scars. And they would, in all likelihood, suffer from what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. It's intriguing to raise the question about the effect of all this up-close and personal bloodletting uh, would have had on the morale and psychological uh, uh, stability uh, of the Israelite soldiers. Many believe Moses used brutal methods in his long campaign to toughen the Israelites for the invasion of Canaan. But it's an invasion that Moses never gets to be part of. 
That very day the Lord spoke to Moses, Ascend these heights of Abarim to Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab facing Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites as their holding. You shall die on the mountain that you are about to ascend. The Bible tells us that God lets Moses see Canaan from the top of Mount Nebo, but doesn't let him enter. Why? After everything that Moses has done in the service of God, it seems like cosmic injustice that he's denied entrance to the promised land. The only explanation the Bible gives is that one time Moses showed a lack of faith and struck a rock with his staff in frustration. And it makes you think, wow, the Old Testament God is strict, but come on. So, one has to wonder, what's really going on here? Some historians believe that there's another reason why Moses never sets foot in the Promised Land. There had been a lot of suffering and a lot of bad decisions made on this great trek. Uh, the extermination of peoples such as the Midianites and attacks, plus attacks on their own Israelites by Moses and his Praetorian God of the Levites, uh, that there's been some speculation that uh, the real reason Moses never made it to the Promised Land is that he was killed by his own people, uh, that they just had had enough of this and just rose up and killed him. As to the murder theory, the Bible is silent. There's not a scintilla of evidence to support this perspective. It just seems that it's a kind of logical consequence to ask, why would a god uh, kill a servant who has spent 40 years or more in his service uh, for what seems to be a minor ritual sin of striking the rock with one's staff? Uh, so it, it's the illogic, it, it's, it's the almost absurdity of the biblical explanation that has led scholars to speculate that Moses have met his end uh, at the hands of his own people rather than at the hands of, of Yahweh himself. Regardless of how Moses dies, the conquest of Canaan will fall to a new generation. The Israelite general Joshua continues the brutal but effective strategies of Moses in his quest to conquer Canaan. And many centuries later, there are examples of his ability to outmaneuver his enemy without actually fighting, as he did when the Israelites escaped the Egyptians. One example is Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce Indian tribe. Uh, 1877, 2000 U.S. Cavalry tried to force the tribe around 800 back onto the Indian Reservation. The tribe fights back against overwhelming odds and leads the U.S. Cavalry on a thousand-mile chase through some of the harshest wilderness in America. At one point, the U.S. General Sturgis believes he has Chief Joseph trapped. But like Moses, Chief Joseph feigns one way and moves another to allow his people a chance to escape. Unlike the Israelites, however, the Nez Perce are eventually captured. The exodus of the Israelites under the leadership of Moses has always been a story of a dazzling escape and a desperate battle for survival. But now, seen through a military perspective, the Israelites are no longer slaves, but mighty warriors. They are held together by one towering personality. We never think of Moses as a military commander because until recently there has been no attempt to analyze the Bible in military terms. But when you do look at it that way, you'll find that this was a man who organized the Israelites, which had a completely trained military arm on his way out of Egypt. This is a man who sacked the city, a man who deceived Pharaoh, and then later on completely reformed the Israel military arm into a first-rate fighting force. Moses is a man of God and a man of the sword, a man who led his people to freedom and to a new homeland.